Right now at 4 o'clock, we're following two big stories for you. We have a chance for thunderstorms on the eastern plains. We have team coverage of the conditions to expect. Also at this hour, 9 News Investigates obtained new body camera video from the day that two deans at East High School in Denver were shot. Let's start first with your forecast. You're taking a live look at the radar right now. A couple of things moving across Colorado. Some rain already falling in parts of our state. We want to get right to our chief meteorologist, Kathy Sabin. Tell us what's going on. You can see the clouds, yeah. at least. Hi, ladies. Welcome into Friday. We made it through the week, and we're welcoming in Friday afternoon with a cold front. And if you've been outside for any length of time, you've felt the wind, and now we see the clouds, and out on the eastern plains, it is severe weather. The mountains could be looking at a little bit of light snow tonight. No advisories for travel there. And the weekend looks warm, but maybe not without thunderstorms. Southeastern Colorado. Colorado, we have a severe thunderstorm watch out until 10 o'clock. Baca, Bent, Prowers, and Cheyenne counties. Two lines, one coming up the I-76 corridor, the other one from Trinidad to Lamar. This is the area that we think has the potential for the hail and the wind, and that is in Cheyenne County. Scattered showers east of Denver. So far, non-severe storms, a lot of thunder, a lot of lightning. And this cell, just to the north of Lamar, tracking northeast, is severe until 430 because of the damaging wind potential and the potential for hail. No reports of that yet, but those of you out on the eastern plains watching us this afternoon, it's going to be a bumpy early evening for you. The good news is these storms are moving quick and will be in Nebraska and Kansas in a couple hours time. We saw a temperature of 72. The front's coming in though. We've dropped 10 degrees in the last hour. Denver at 61 right now, but that's only part of the story. If you've been outside, you know the wind has been ferocious and it is super gusty out there right now. If you have travel in or out of DIA, call ahead. The front's coming in and flights may be delayed. A check of the radar. Your weekend forecast is coming up. For the first time, we are seeing the video of the massive response to a shooting inside East High School last March. Nine News Investigates has obtained body camera video that shows the chaotic morning an East High School student shot and injured two deans. Crime and Justice reporter Kelly Rinke was the first to request the video, and she spent the day combing through it. She joins us now to walk us through the body camera. Yeah, hey guys, we want to warn viewers our home. Some of this video may be hard to watch. Very quickly, staff were able to identify their suspect. He's a student who enrolled at East about two months earlier and had a history with weapons. <laughs> 10 minutes before 10 a.m., the call comes in, shooting inside East High School. The response is immediate and massive, just as you would expect in an era of school shootings. As officers enter the school from the west, it's clear there are injuries. It's also clear the suspect is gone. I can show you this picture. I'll show you the picture. Within a minute, the call goes out to the city. This, we could try to print this out. This is the suspect right here. Police call it a bolo. Be on the lookout for. Eleven Adam, the name is going to be Austin Lyle. Austin Lyle, a student who had enrolled in the school just two and a half months prior. So they assume he went home? They're guessing. Nine News Investigates has this picture of the gun police say he used to shoot two East High Deans. It's what's known as a ghost gun, untraceable because it's homemade, has no serial number. It's precisely what had gotten Lyle into trouble just a year and a half earlier when Overland High School and the Cherry Creek School System kicked him out for building another gun. That one, an AR-15 style rifle with the silencer attached to the end. Back at East, as paramedics wheeled one of the high school deans out of the school, the search for the shooter is officially on. By nightfall, they would find Lyle's body in a remote section of Jefferson County next to his father's car. We did reach out to the school district for a comment. Part of a statement from a spokesperson said DPS followed all applicable laws governing discipline, safety and enrollment. Current search policy at DPS says campus safety officers, not administrators, conduct searches for weapons. OK, and Kelly, when you see this video, it really gives you a new perspective to what has been described as a very chaotic day. But so much discussion about the pat down, the search. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and we have a lot more information that's coming up at five and six o'clock, uh, specifically on what DPS knew and also on that search policy, what that looked like on the day of the shooting. Yeah, thank you. We know we'll look forward to that. Thank you, Kelly. If you have a tip for Nine News Investigates, you can email us at Nine News Investigates at Nine News. Com. The principal who admitted she made mistakes after an attempted kidnapping at her school is no longer in charge of that school. Cherry Creek Schools announced it has appointed an acting principal instead of Amanda Rapogel. On April 19th, a suspect interrupted recess at Black Forest Hills Elementary, tried to grab a student. The students were able to get away and teacher's assistants ultimately scared off the suspect. Parents were upset with school leaders for how this was handled. The school did not call a secure perimeter and it let students walk home that day. Now the district has appointed Chuck Puga as the acting principal for the rest of the year. He's the former principal at Smoky Hill High School. The district said it has reviewed all of its safety protocols, it's added security, and the district says its HR investigation is now in the final stages. We've asked Cherry Creek if the former principal is still employed with the school. The district said it cannot share personnel matters. Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment is now investigating a home health care company that paid a man and his girlfriend to take care of the man's mother. The investigation started after the couple was charged in the woman's death. We want to warn you, some of the details of this story can be very hard to hear. The woman's son spoke to Nine News reporter Steve Steger from the Jefferson County Jail. Steve? And Jenny, uh, Brian Seitz says his 58-year-old mother had severe rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. She couldn't move. She was blind. He'd cared for her for about eight years, getting paid from a home health care company for some of that time. And earlier this week, first responders found her on an air mattress in the garage of an Airbnb with maggots on her body covered in her own filth. Well, we were trying to help out my mom and... Next thing you know, I'm in jail. Police would say it's not as simple as Brian Seitz makes it out to be. After all, they only started investigating after first responders were called to an Arvada Airbnb earlier this week and found 58-year-old Cheryl Seitz on an air mattress in the garage, covered in her own filth, her body covered in maggots, her hip broken in two places, her wrist nearly dislocated. How does she end up with maggots all over her body in a garage of an Airbnb. Well, she had the maggots on her before she got to the Airbnb. That's one of the reasons we went to the Airbnb. We tried to get her help. We did. Cheryl Seitz was blind and immobile, and police say she lived in an RV on an RV storage lot with heat from only a space heater. How did she get to live in a trailer with no running water, with no bed? Ask Adult Protective Services. Because you were a caregiver, right? Yeah. Yes, Brian Seitz was his mother's caregiver. He says he and his girlfriend, Laura Pratts, each got paid some of his mom's Medicaid money to care for her. I think it was $2,200 a month, maybe. Paid by a company called Lark Home Care. State health officials confirmed to me today that Lark Home Care is now being investigated. I'm sure there are people out there wondering, you're making $2,200 a month. I, didn't, I don't care about the money. But you did at the time, right? No, I didn't. I still didn't care about the money. That's not why I did this. And why didn't I quit? Because my mom didn't want me to. Because my, my mom knew that I would, my mom wanted me to be there by her side. What else am I supposed to do then? Should I have called Nine News? Should I have called you guys? Because you guys seem like you guys are doing a pretty good, uh, good job of investigating it right now. I'm trying to figure out how someone gets to the condition where they're near death in an Airbnb. She didn't want us to call an ambulance ever again on her. She didn't but want to go the to the hospital. You're so the that's, caregiver, right? I'm the caregiver. That's my mom. If she doesn't want me to call an ambulance on her, I'm not going to call an ambulance for her. So I asked the state today if this is standard practice, a family member getting paid through a home health care company to provide care for their loved one. They told me, yes, that can happen, but the home health care company is responsible for making sure the patient is getting the care they deserve, hence the investigation in this case. I've tried multiple times to reach the owner of Lark Home Care. She hasn't gotten back to me. In the newsroom, Steve Steger, Nine News. I, this story it's if it can upset you more than it did yesterday, Steve, it did today because it seems like so many people failed this woman. Yeah, you know, it goes back to December where Adult Protective Services got involved. She was in the hospital in December and the ambulance was taking her back to this RV and refused to drop her off there. Now, a few days later, the Jefferson County Sheriff actually went out there to check out the RV and said that it was in order and that they could drop her off there. But you have a lot of people pointing fingers at different people in this case, including Brian Seitz, who's now charged in her death. 
uh, and, and a lot more to try to find out about this home health care company, Ken. And I appreciate you, Steve, asking him some hard questions. <laughs> Yeah, I think that among the people who needs to answer them, he's on that list. Yeah, you know, in this case, he was the caregiver and he was getting paid to care for his mother. I tried to press him a bit on that. He did at one point stand up and walk away from that interview. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll maybe learn a bit more as this case proceeds. All right. Steve Steger, thank you for, for doing that job today. Thank you.